You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday True Crime edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There is a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. Uh, Before we start on this week's podcast, uh, there's a little bit of housekeeping we should do just to mark this moment in history, tell you how our week went. Um, A great deal of things happened this week. We had our refrigerator quit on us. So we had the refrigerator guy come in a couple days ago and fix it. And we're grateful that he was able to find the problem and fix it. And most of the food was salvageable. Um, And this morning on Friday the 13th, January, Friday the 13th, we awoke to discover that Junior Junior Dude's car had been stolen from out of our driveway. Yeah. And we we know that it was sometime... Uh, before the snow fell last night, because there were no tracks in the snow, but we woke this morning to find we'd been uh, cards stolen from our, right in front of our house sometime in the middle of the night, which kind of threw a monkey wrench into our plans. Well, and um, we we should say that we're not in a crime ridden area. No. Um, no. And the police said, "No, this is a TikTok challenge." Right. The particular been- make and model of Junior Dude's car is part of a TikTok challenge. To steal this particular make and model of car. And it's not, you know, this isn't a late model sports car. It's not, no. it's nice, but it's not, it's a Kia. Yeah. But the stealing a Kia is now a TikTok challenge. And so we, I expect they're going to be able to recover this car. But, yeah. and so the, we had cops the... Seen, the cops this morning seem pretty confident too. But yeah. So we had the police over this morning, which we is had the always police a delight. over this morning. So I had to get my head together and like have a cup of coffee and get ready yeah. to go. But it's Friday the 13th and we had a car stolen first thing in the morning. And just a few moments ago, my wife summoned me to the other end of the house. Right. And say, we were already set up to do the yeah. podcast and he had his earbuds in and everything. I said, no, rock and roll. drop everything and come to the front of the house and look out the window. And, and what, what did I see out in front? An entire flock of black crows had taken up residence in our front yard. Our front yard full of black, <laughs> large blackbirds. Large, large crows. ravens yeah. out there. Big ass <laughs> ravens out in front of our, on Friday the 13th. Uh, so if this podcast suddenly cuts out or yeah. is struck by lightning or something, uh, it's not us. It's just a confluence of, of mystical events that's causing this to happen to us today. But Can I if- add one more thing, Drift Glass? Oh, sure. Of course. Youngest child is a college freshman and she's going back to school uh, beginning of next week. And she's still asleep. And she slept through all of this. She yeah. slept through the car getting stolen. She slept through the cops showing up. She slept through all of it. And she's still upstairs asleep so dead of the world so dead of the world she promises she's going to get back on a sleep schedule this weekend i doubt it yeah, but, yeah. we all make promises and sometimes we keep them and sometimes yeah, but when we she don't. has to get up to go to biology class or whatever she it does. is she will she she's will. a responsible young lady yeah um so that's so, where we're at yeah physically mentally this emotionally. morning and by the way this is the third podcast we're recording this week yeah I mean, yeah, I don't. I, mean, I haven't had any time to do anything else. Right. So yeah, if if my blog's been a little light, and mm-hmm. my my correspondence has been a little uh, terse, uh, I I have just spent all my time researching and typing. Uh, researching and typing for this particular podcast uh, as actually has been a pleasure because yes. today we're going to talk about a gifted public speaker who is also a lawyer and a product of Chicago politics and the first black man ever to be elected to the job he held. And the day he won that job, the opposition lost its damn mind. You want Harold? Well, here's Harold. (laughs) So for nostalgia purposes and for luck purposes, I'm holding my very own personal vintage IVI IPO Harold Washington for Mayor Button. 
That's Independent Voters of Illinois, independent precinct organizations. I was a proud member of that outfit for a while. Uh, we vetted candidates for local office, including people like Barack Obama, who lost, but that's cool anyway. It's a product of the Button Farm in Oaklawn, Illinois. If you're looking for a quality button produced sometime in the 1980s, that's the place you'd go if you're a time traveler. And the IVI IPO always cracked me up because they're both chartered as independent and they're not. They're democratic organizations. They're left-leaning democratic organizations, but the concept that independent is a very funny word because it doesn't really mean anything uh, goes all the way back in my mind to the 80s when I was like, really? Because everybody we're, we're vetting and, and proposing is a Democrat. Yep. But in we got to go all the way back past that to 1976. And in 1976, the biggest political earthquake to hit the greater Chicagoland area was not the Bicentennial, which some of you might have lived through and remember, or the election of James Earl Carter, or Patty Hearst's conviction for armed robbery, or yours truly, going to high school debate camp in Pittsburgh for three weeks in July. It was the day in December, five days before Christmas, when the mayor of the city of Chicago dropped dead. That was Richard J. Daly, who was the last of the big city machine bosses, who'd been absolute ruler of Chicago and Cook County and pretty much all of Illinois politics for 21 years, which is a record that would remain unbroken until his son, Richard M. Daly, who is known to some of us fans of council wars as R2-D2, was elected in 1996 and served for 22 years. Now, what followed the death of Richard I was a kind of low-grade chaos. See, for you government studies wonks out there, technically, Chicago operates under what's called a strong council weak mayor system. And that means that any issue introduced in the city council must pass with a majority vote. And if the mayor vetoes the measure, the council can override it with a two-thirds vote, and the mayor would break any ties. Except under the mayor, Richard I, there were never any tie votes to break. As anyone who had ever been to Chicago for more than a minute during the reign of Richard I knew, strong council, weak mayor was not how anything worked in the no. city. No, man. The, the Chicago government was a textbook political machine, tightly organized hierarchy where everyone answered to the boss, the mayor. Who built the pyramids, Drift Glass? The mayor built the pyramids. Everybody knows that. <laughs> Everybody knows that the mayor Chicago he built he built them pyramids. You just ask anybody from the, from the south side. From the south side, they'll tell you that's mm -hmm. right. Daly controlled every aspect of city government. He appointed every commissioner and department head. He embedded his personal political enforcers everywhere. The city council, which was full of thirsty crooks, might have been able to take on Daly if they had ever been able to organize themselves to do so. But instead of five or ten ambitious aldermen, each with their own power base and huge constituency, the Chicago City Council was and is a collection of 50, 5 -0, oh, squabbling, jumped-up ward healers, each looking after their own slice of the pie, and almost all of whom owed their political lives and fortunes to Mayor Daley. So when the boss died, the reaction was, holy crap, what do we do now? No one was really quite sure what was supposed to happen next. And, you know, his kid, Richie, Richie Daly, you might have heard of him too, was at the time uh, being groomed as Daly's successor, but he was still too young. And he was learning the family business down here in Springfield at the Illinois Senate, where he rarely spoke to reporters, didn't hold a single news conference for six years, and was named one of Illinois' worst state legislators by Chicago Magazine, quote, for arrogance, for shark-like qualities, for living off his father's name, and for pulling puppet strings attached to some of the worst members of the Senate, unquote. So, you know, a real daily. There was a guy named Wilson Frost at the time who was the president pro tem of the city council, and he decided to declare himself acting mayor, but most of the rest of the council said, that's a dumb idea, so we're not doing that. Finally, the council selected Alderman Mike Belandic to serve as acting mayor until they could do a special election and elect someone to finish out the balance of Daly's term. They gave the gig to Belandic on the condition that he would really, really definitely not run in that election. But Belandic was a Chicago politician. And he knew that when opportunity comes knocking, 
you throw the door open and grab whatever's out there, regardless of what promises you might have made to the contrary. So he said, screw it, and ran anyway, and he won. And then he won a full term on his own name, defeating Republican candidate Dennis Block, Socialist Labor Party candidate Dennis Brasky, and U.S. Labor Party candidate Gerald Rose, because there have been a lot of third parties in Chicago that no one outside the city has ever heard of. However, Bolandic was no daily, and his first and last full term as mayor was short and difficult. There were labor disputes, including a grave diggers and cemetery owner strike. <laughs> <laughs> Which is perfect. Just perfect. Which is perfect. It's tailor-made to make headlines in the Chicago papers. There was social unrest when an FALN bomb exploded in City Hall and started a two-day riot in the Puerto Rican community. Then came the blizzard of 1979. Yeah. 21 inches of snow in two days which virtually shut the city down, and for which Chicagoans blamed Belandic for the city's slow response. Belandic also ordered Chicago L trains to bypass many intermediate stops, which effectively cut off many black neighborhoods on the south side of the city and infuriated that very large voter base. In 1979, Belandic lost to Jane Byrne in the Democratic primary, and Byrne went on to be the city's first female mayor, largely as a result of a single snowstorm. Since that time, Chicago mayors have rolled out the snow plows the minute the first flake hits the ground. Yeah, that was is a, a fact. There's a, there was a huge snowstorm during uh, Richie Daly's term. And he the, the bright idea was like, we'll move cars to one side of the street, then the other. And then he blamed his head of streets and sand for screwing up and he you know, fobbed it off on him. And someone reminded him that... Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, pretty much everybody who works for you is a, it was appointed by you. And that guy over there has known you for 30 years and you appointed him like six months ago. And at that point, Daly said, oh, yeah, no, no, he's doing a great job. He's doing a great job. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a gift from God. So, you know, every mayor down to their bones knows that the snowstorm can kill your career. And a Daly had to be reminded that he couldn't blame someone that he himself had had groomed and put in that position. So he just invented this whole alternate universe where he was doing a good job and he got away with it. Yeah. The story of Jane Byrne is a whole other thing and a different subject for a different day. For our purposes, what you need to know is that by 1982, Byrne had been significantly weakened. She was trailing behind Richard M. Daly, who had moved up to the office of Cook County State's Attorney, by 3% in a poll done by the Chicago Tribune in July 1982. Unlike the 1979 mayoral election, in which Byrne received nearly 60% of the African-American vote, Byrne's performance as mayor had led half of these voters to desert her. Mm -hmm. And then along came Harold. Yeah, baby. Then along came Harold. And uh, they had a series of, I think, three debates in 1983 that were uh, famous in their own right and incredibly entertaining. Uh, and Washington, who was an amazing orator, clearly outclassed both Byrne and Daly. Uh, in Daly's case, that wasn't hard because, like his dad, R2-D2 had been in a long, losing, life-or-death struggle with the English language his entire life. So he was known for it. And after one of the debates, the Daly campaign scolded a local paper. As I recall, I'm pretty sure it was the Chicago Reader, for daring to print verbatim some of the incoherent mumbling that actually came out of his mouth <laughs> as opposed to what he meant to say. How dare you quote me verbatim. Um, now, Washington pummeled the crap out of Byrne with her own record. He castigated her for deserting her progressive principles, saying that she offered Chicago's poor and unemployed, quote, hams, thermal underwear, fireworks, lighted bridges, and a winter fest. For the rest of us, she has offered an obscene, $10 million campaign fund aimed at brainwashing Chicago into forgetting that the real Jane Byrne and believing that the Madison Avenue creation appearing in all those TV ads is the real Jane Byrne who's been running this city, unquote. Um, even the New York Times noticed what was going on here. The headline from the Times, February 2nd, 1983, announced last debate signals final stages of Chicago's acrimonious Democratic mayoral race. But the subheading 
was the interesting part. The subheading was, best speaker is least known. Quote, the 60-year-old Mr. Washington, the son and grandson of two Methodist ministers, is the best speaker of the three. As the candidate's least well-known citywide, the Southside congressman may have gained the most from the televised debates with his direct answers, word plays, and forthright claim that the city simply needs more money and that means more taxes. Mr. Washington, who is seeking to become the first black elected mayor here, has championed the cause of Chicago blacks and Spanish-speaking citizens, now a majority, and says he wants open government equally for all, rooting out the, quote, racism that permeates all aspects of Chicago's government. He said last night, I am running to end Jane Byrne's four-year effort to further institutionalize racial discrimination in this great city. Mr. Washington, who has raised just $500,000, is said to be a reluctant candidate persuaded to run after a groundswell of newly registered black voters pushed their total to about 650,000 of a 1.7 million total voter estimate, unquote. And when it was over, Daly and Byrne had split the bulk of the Democratic Party machine vote and Washington had run up the middle, winning the primary with 36.3% of the vote. Yay! Chicago was and is a one-party town that hasn't had a Republican mayor since the days of Prohibition, when Mayor Big Bill Thompson was little more than one of Al Capone's errand boys. So the real election for mayor has always been the Democratic primary, and Washington had just won. Also, over the years, the Chicago machine had also included a few black politicians among its Irish and Polish-dominated ranks. They were compliant go-along types like all machine polls are. And in fact, during his 20 years in office in the Illinois House, the Illinois Senate, and the U.S. House of Representatives, Harold Washington had always been a loyal party member. But no serious candidate for mayor had ever talked about race the way Harold did. And for damn sure, no serious candidate for mayor had ever talked about allocating city services fairly and equitably, as opposed to lavishing the white ethnic wards with goodies and letting minority wards go begging, or raising taxes to pay for those services. Speaking to an audience of mostly black Chicagoans in 1983, he said, I will be fair to everybody, but I'm going to insist that for the first time, this city is going to be fair to you. And everybody knew who you was. Oh, yeah. They, they, they do da- they'd lived through it. They lived through it for, for decades. Yeah. And so then the openly racist backlash from the remnants of the Daily Machine was swift and loud. Yeah, it wasn't subtle at all. Uh, nope. For starters, <laughs> Washington's opponent was an obscure Republican state legislator named Bernie Epton. Now, Bernie Epton had virtually no name recognition, and his ads were terrible, and he looked kind of like an embittered middle school truant officer who'd maybe had a little too much to drink that day. But Bernie Epton had one quality that was more important than any other. He was white. And when his campaign started running various local TV ads, each with the tagline, Epton for mayor, before it's too late... Several Democratic aldermen and ward bosses and hundreds of thousands of lifelong white Democrats suddenly discovered their inner Republican, and they flocked to his cause. Uh, This is from NPR's Alex Kotlowitz, who reported years later, quote, Soon, anonymous leaflets popped up in white neighborhoods all over the city. One of them read, quote, Your vote for Mr. Epton will stop contamination of the city hall by a Mr. Baboon. Unquote. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Like I said, there's nothing subtle about Chicago races. Around town, Epton supporters donned various buttons, one depicting a watermelon with a slash through it, another button with nothing on it. It was just all white. None of these were being distributed by Epton's campaign, but it was all being done in his name. Unquote. It was a very, very ugly campaign. And if you were there, you know, God bless you, because it was a war zone. Turnout for the election was 82.7%, and when all the votes were counted, Washington had won, barely, by a margin of 51.7 to 48%, which by Chicago standards was completely unheard of. The day after Washington's narrow victory, 
the great reporter and my hero and chronicler of all things Chicago, Mike Royko, headlined his daily column with what Adam Doster over at the Chicago Magazine described as one of the great leads in Chicago journalism history. Quote, so I told Uncle Chester, don't worry, Harold Washington doesn't want to marry your sister. For the record, there was no Uncle Chester or Aunt Wanda or Slats Grobnik. These were fictional characters, Chicago archetypes, with whom Royko would converse in print about the goings-on in the city. And in one sentence, Royko described with machine lathe precision exactly what was galloping around through the terrified minds of hundreds of thousands of Chicago's ethnic white Uncle Chesters. Yeah, Royko, just so you know, Royko wrote a column a day, every day, five days a week, for decades. There's nobody, nobody writing any other than certain maybe Midwest bloggers that I could name um, who can match that kind of output. It, it is a struggle for people at the New York Times to crank out one column a week. And Royko's columns were masterpieces. Um, and they were full of a lot of fictional characters that reflected his experience in Chicago with whom he would have conversations. Royko knew mobsters. He knew presidents. He knew artists. He, he just knew the whole city backwards and forwards. And he was literally irreplaceable. And he went on to explain just how much Harold's experience had differed from the ethnic white Chicagoans who hated him on site, and just how extraordinary it was that Harold had not allowed their hate to drag him down to their level. Quote, that might seem like a strange thing to have to tell somebody about the man who will be the next mayor of Chicago. I never had to tell Uncle Chester that Mayor Daly or Mayor Berlandek wouldn't marry his sister. On the other hand, no other mayor in the long and wild-eyed history of Chicago has had one attribute of Washington. He's black. It appears to be a waste of space to bother pointing that out since every Chicagoan knows it. But you can't write about Harold Washington's victory without taking note of his skin color. Yes, he is black. And that fact is going to create a deep psychological depression in many of the white ethnic neighborhood people who read this paper in the morning. Eek, the next mayor of Chicago is going to be a black man. Let's all quiver and quake. Oh, come on. Let's all act like sensible adult human beings. Let's take note of a few facts about Harold Washington. First, Washington was born in an era when they still lynched people in some parts of the United States. By lynched, I mean they took a black man out of his home, put a rope around his neck, and murdered him by hanging. Then they went home to bed knowing that they were untouchable because the sheriff helped pull the rope. Washington suffered through it. God knows how he did that. I think most of us, white, privileged, the success road wide open before us, might have turned into haters. But Washington didn't turn into a hater. Instead, he developed a capacity for living with his tormentors and understanding that in the flow of history, there are deep valleys and heady peaks. He fought in World War II. Yes, blacks did that, although you don't see them in many John Wayne movies. He went to college, got a degree. Then he went to Northwestern University's law school at a time when blacks were as common as alligators there. Had Washington been white, he would have tied in with a good law firm, sat behind a desk, made a good buck, and today would be playing golf at a private country club. But for a black man, even one as bright as Washington, an NU degree meant that he was just about smart enough to handle divorce cases for impoverished blacks. Being no dummy, he gravitated towards politics. And the Democratic Party, it may have been pseudo-liberal, but the Democratic Party did offer a black man a chance, meager and piddling as it might be. And he went somewhere. Come on, admit that, at least, even while you're brewed about a black man becoming your next mayor. He became a state legislator, then a United States congressman. I'm still enough of an idealist to think that most people who become members of Congress are at least a cut or two above the rest of us. This is my drift glass aside. That's how long ago this was written. End of my aside. Back to Royko. And even his critics say that as a state legislator and a U.S. congressman, he was pretty good. So I ask you, if Jane Byrne is qualified to be mayor of Chicago after holding no higher office than city consumer affairs commissioner, what is the rap on Harold Washington? I also ask you, if Richard M. Daly is qualified to be mayor, after being a state legislator and state's attorney at Cook County, 
what is so unthinkable about a man holding the mayor's office after being a state legislator and a U.S. congressman? The fact is, Washington's credentials for this office exceed those of Byrne, Belandic, Richard J. Daley, Martin Kennelly, Ed Kelly, Anton Cermak, and most of those who've held the office of the mayor of the city of Chicago. Byrne was a minor bureaucrat. Belandic's highest office was alderman. Richard J. Daly was the county clerk. Kennelly was a moving company executive. Kelly was a sanitation district payroller. And Anton Cermak was a barely literate but street smart hustler. All became mayor, and nobody was horrified. But this morning, the majority of Chicagoans, since this city's majority is white, are gape jawed at the prospect of Representative Washington becoming mayor. Relax, please, at least for the moment. There will be time to become, become tense and angry when he fouls up as mayor, as anybody in that miserable job inevitably will do. Until he fouls up, though, give him a chance. The man is a United States citizen with roots deeper than most of us have in this country. He is 60-year-old Chicagoan who has been in politics and government most of his life. He is a smart, witty politically savvy old pro. He is far more understanding of the fears and fantasies of Chicago whites than we are of the frustrations of Chicago blacks. The city isn't going to slide into the river. The sun will come up today and tomorrow, and your real estate values won't collapse. History shows that real estate values in a town like Chicago go up and up over the long haul no matter who is mayor. He will fire a police superintendent, he will hire a new one, and the earth won't shake under us. He might hire some jerks. I haven't seen a mayor who hasn't. They don't learn. Two days before Lady Jane was elected, I wrote, how she does will depend on the kind of people she surrounds herself with. She surrounded herself with Charles Swibel and other bums and got what she deserved. That's why I love Royco. <laughs> if Washington is smart, which I think he is, He'll surround himself with the very best talents and minds available, and they are available. If not, we'll survive and we'll throw him out. Meanwhile, don't get hysterical. As I wrote four years ago, if we survive Belandic, we can survive Jane Byrne. And if we survive Jane, we can easily survive Harold Washington. And who knows? We might even end up liking him. Unquote. Hats off to Mike Royko, man. My guy. I'm glad you read that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pure Chicago. Yeah. And and we included that entire column because it's the best statement of the era to the city's white population. He addressed this column. Yes, he did. <laughs> and besides, there's forever and always only one Mike Royko, for gosh yeah. sakes. But in spite of this wonderful column, uh, Chicago's white ethnic enclaves weren't listening. And in their rage and panic, the white aldermen who represented those wards saw an opportunity. Twenty eight white alderman and one Hispanic alderman, a solid majority of the 100% Democratic City Council, led by Alderman Fast Eddie Vidoliak, joined forces to obstruct and sabotage everything the new Democratic mayor tried to accomplish. And phrases like the Eddies, the Vidoliak 29, Council Wars, and Beirut by the Lake, for gosh sakes. My yeah. goodness. Yeah, it was bad entered into the colorful vocabulary of Chicago. What happened next should have been studied carefully and taken to heart by one Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. Because the confrontation between Harold Washington and the stubborn, racist Verdoliac 29 almost exactly parallels the confrontation that Obama would face with a stubborn, racist Republican Party a quarter of a century later. The big difference was that Washington wasn't surprised by the reaction of racist voters and council members, whereas Obama appears to have been caught completely flat-footed by Republican obstruction and had no practical plan to deal with it. In the first session of the new council term, the Verdoliac 29 voted themselves control of every council committee, and over the next three years, while they did pass Washington's budgets, they voted down all of his proposals and all of his appointments so directors, chiefs, and commissioners could only serve in an interim slash acting capacity. Yeah. Doesn't that it, sound familiar? This should all sound extremely familiar to anyone following politics. Um, on the other hand, since the Verdoliac 29 had a majority, but not a three-fifths majority, 
they didn't have enough votes to override a Washington veto. And so Chicago staggered through three years of brutal, racist siege warfare and legislative gridlock, which again should sound very familiar to anyone who lived through the Obama years. Wreak as much havoc as possible by blocking every single thing the duly elected mayor proposed while incessantly inflaming the paranoia and rage of their base. Force Harold to sustain basic city operations by executive order and then attack him for being a dictator. Make the city ungovernable on purpose and then try to hold Harold responsible for the poison fruits of their deliberate sabotage, all while their racist constituents cheered them on. Meanwhile, Washington's allies sued the city in federal court, claiming that the ward map drawn up after the 1980 census had unfairly gerrymandered black and Hispanic voters. At that time, whites were about 40% of the city population, blacks were also about 40%, and Hispanics were about 15%. But there were 33 white aldermen, only 16 blacks, and just one Hispanic. So, in 1986, the court ruled in their favor and ordered changes to the configuration of seven wards, and that special elections happen in those newly drawn wards. And Washington supporters picked up three seats in the special election, and then months later, Louis Gutierrez, who was not a congressman at the time, who was just an alderman, won in the 22nd ward. This gave Washington a 25-25 tie in the council, and by the rules of the council, the mayor gets to cast the tie-breaking vote. So, seeing which way the wind was blowing, Several of those hardy, stubborn, Verdoliac 29 aldermen, including a guy named Dick Mell, who is the father-in-law of future governor and federal prisoner Rod Blagojevich, defected and swore that the Eddies had forced them to be contrarian bigots. Oh, no. I know, they made us do racism. They made us. Forced me to be racist. Yep. Uh, this effectively ended council wars for all time. Washington's bigger challenge was the structure of city government itself, which was a mess. Big city political machines like Chicago were designed to be very efficient at delivering favors and collecting votes and money, but were completely unsuited to carrying out systemic reforms. In 1975, Sun-Times columnist Bob Green asked former alderman Patty Baller, originator of the famous quote, Chicago ain't ready for reform whether the city was ready yet. Chicago? Baller responded, Christ, who the hell would want to live here if it was? This is the big city, boy. This ain't Honolulu. Reform? It'll never be ready. Not as long as I'm alive. I think we know what reform is code for. We have, we know, well, in yeah, Patty getting rid Baller's of, world. Yeah, you know, getting rid you of know, envelopes over the door. It means the black over, you know. Well, it, it means the blacks take over and it means no more money over the transom for, you know, favors. And your right. brother-in-law, your stupid brother-in-law ain't going to find a job in city government no more. In the city government with a pension. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. It was like that and worse when Washington took over. Gary Rivlin of the Chicago Reader described the situation this way in his March 1992 article, Everybody's Mayor. Quote, the council wars didn't surprise him as they did many of his supporters, what else would you expect, he asked, when you grab the tiger by the tail? It was the 40,000 employee bureaucracy that seemed overwhelming. We were like the Sandinistas rolling into town one day and running the government the next, said one top Washington aide. The dead weight of City Hall was oppressive. The departments that suffered the worst neglect were those that Black Chicago relied upon disproportionately the Chicago Housing Authority, a public school system whose student body was 80% non-white, and the Department of Public Health. Middle management posed a great challenge. City Hall was a collection of administrators promoted for their political performance in the wards rather than their accomplishments in the workplace. A HUD report on the Chicago Housing Authority said that the vast majority of staff show no professional quality and are incapable of implementing the changes needed to turn the CHA around. HUD deemed only four or five of the CHA's 19 project managers as competent. Washington would place top policy people above them, but middle management was not easily fired, especially given the Shackman Decree, a court order forbidding the city to fire anyone for political or policy reasons, except for those on the top rungs of government, unquote. 
Yeah, the Shackman degree really bit him in the ass because yeah. the Shackman degree was put in place because of the first daily. You mm-hmm. know, it was it it was the city was sued for filling the to the rafters a bunch of positions that should never be filled by political hacks with political hacks and brothers in law. Mm-hmm. And the Shackman degree said you can't do that. You the people who are direct reports to the mayor um, and a few others who are actually political appointees, yeah, you can you can hire and fire those people, but below that. You can't go around just firing people because you don't like their politics and putting your dumbass brother-in-law in place. Well, the problem well, and was... The, isn't it true that the Shackman... You, Shackman, like, if your position was political, yeah. you were called a Shackman appointee, yeah, right? I, I worked with people who were literally... Their job title was literally Shackman exempt. And yeah. if you're Shackman exempt, that meant on, you know, a couple of days or weeks before an election, they would suddenly not be in the office anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'd be out, you know, they'd be out handing out leaflets... They were working the polls. They they had a political appointment, and there were reserved positions that were right. Shackman. And there uh, are people in who work, like you say, directly under the mayor. Yeah, who are there in part to get the mayor reelected. Right. It, it's like the cabinet. You know, I right. mean, the cabinet. If you come into office as a new president, you get to appoint your own cabinet, assuming mm-hmm. they they make it through the confirmation hearings. It commissioners and deputies and chiefs are a lot like that. But the idea was, you don't want that that influence reaching all the way down into, <coughs> excuse me, clerks and file people and, right. and social workers. The right. problem you can have was Pete Buttigieg running the transportation department, but you don't want him landing planes. Right. But the problem was those positions were already filled with political hacks. Yes. Right. And so, right. And firing them for cause was exhausting. I mean, you know, it took, it took an enormous amount of work and you know who really screwed him over the P- the person who was leaving office, Jane Byrne, Jane Byrne and her staff made absolutely sure that Washington got no help from them. And this is from the Mr. Riven's article uh, once again. Quote, his first day on the job, Washington told one writer he searched through Byrne's desk and looked into filing cabinets, yet just about all he found was a single paper clip. I sat there and laughed for 10 minutes, Washington said. There was nothing there. No personnel files, nothing. Most of Byrne's aides proved equally useless. Many ignored Washington's transition team's requests for a bit of their time. Of those willing to grant an interview, most offered clipped, minimal answers that sounded like testimony from a hostile witness. There were printed reports, unsubstantiated, of massive shredding parties in the last days of the Byrne administration. This is a brief aside for me. Remember, Jane Byrne still has political ambitions. She's thinking she can come back in three years and win this office back. So sabotaging Washington is a political move, unquote from me. Uh, Back to Mr. Riven. Other hindrances were non-malicious, but no less confounding. When Rob Meyer, who Washington appointed to take over the Department of Economic Development, reviewed personnel files on each employee in his department, as one does, he didn't find out much. Employees with 20 or 30 years of experience had next to nothing in their files. Meyer said there were no progress reports or evaluations, usually nothing more that a single letter, a recommendation from the political sponsor who had secured the job in the first place, unquote. Uh, It was a brutal first term in office. You're fighting against city council who are sabotaging you at every turn and a city bureaucracy designed to fail and staff with everybody's incompetent meathead cousin. And then it was time to run for office again. And this time, Harold Washington would face none other than fast Eddie Verdoliak himself in the general election. Now, Washington would go on to beat him, but you may be asking yourself, how could that possibly be? After all, Verdoliak was a Democrat, and the primaries are where those fights are settled. So did Verdoliak flip completely, join the Republican Party just so he could screw Washington, or what? No, that is not what happened. Republicans nominated Donald Hader, a business professor who was a former city budget director and a former Democrat. During the campaign, Hayter was getting so little notice in the press that he rented an elephant and mm-hmm. rode it down State Street. It didn't matter. In the general election, Hayter barely managed to get 4% of the vote. Instead, Verdoliak glommed on to an independent third party called the Illinois Solidarity Party. Doesn't that sound nice, Driftglass? A third Solidarity. party? I hear, I hear good things about third parties these days. <laughs> 
And here hangs a hilarious and typically Chicago tale. Yeah, begin it, begin it like you should every story from Chicago. Once upon a time. Once upon a time. There was a man named Lyndon LaRouche, who was a fairly well-known kook and conspiracy monger. And he's somebody that like ran for president 30 times, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He was one of those guys. Yeah. Linda LaRouche was about 60% Alex Jones and 40% Michael Flynn. And if he were hitting his peak now instead of in the 1980s, he'd ha- he'd definitely have his own show on oh, Newsmax. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, he'd be a star. Yeah. Totally be a star. Uh, you know, I think there's a little bit of Mike Pillow in there, too. He's oh, just yeah. a little, he's a kooky person. LaRouche was a David Horowitz type, someone who began as a far left conspiracy nut, but flipped hard and became a conspiracy nut of the far more welcoming and profitable right. Yeah, that's just like diamond and silk also. Uh huh. The LaRouche cult also attracted a cadre of young fanatical followers who were always running for some public office or another and losing. Well, and usually losing. Until, and this is where this tale takes a lovely turn, Mark Fairchild and Janice Hart, who came in under the radar and won the Democratic Party's nomination for Lieutenant Governor and Illinois Secretary of State, respectively. Um, It's widely believed to this very day that a big reason they won was because their names sounded less ethnic than their opponents. And their opponents were George Sangmeister and Aurelia Paczynski. And Aurelia Paczynski's daddy... Roman Paczynski was an outspoken hater of Harold Washington, which put the whole family on bad paper with a lot of voters. So these two nice sounding people slid in under the radar and they won the primary. And it was only after they won the primary that it came out that Fairchild and Hart were LaRouche's, which in turn freaked out Senator Adlai Stevenson III, who was now going to run for governor and was the candidate for governor for the Democratic Party, but did not want to run on the same ticket as anyone remotely associated with Lyndon LaRouche. And so before you could say Patty Baller, the Illinois Solidarity Party was invented out of thin air. It was named after Lech Walesa's Solidarity Movement in Poland, which, by the way, did we mention that at the time, Chicago had the largest Polish population outside of Warsaw? Have we mentioned that recently? (laughs) Um, So by conjuring up a boutique third party at the last minute, All that did was confuse the hell out of everybody. And most analysts, including later Stevens himself, agreed that the whole mess just served to help Republican Party Jim Thompson win re-election as governor. Mm. So Stevenson, done with the party, cuts his ties with the Illinois Solidarity Party. But there it is floating out there in space, still a third party, still on the ballot, still registered and certified. And who comes along but fast Amy Verdoliak and hitches a, uh, hitches a ride with this third party so he could run against Harold Washington in the general election. Even after Vidoliak lost by 130,000 votes and Washington was reelected, the Illinois Solidarity Party limped along for many, many years as an easy stalking horse for other small political parties to take over whenever necessary. Now, as a public service, I'm going to do a brief aside about what happened to the Illinois Solidarity Party and a fun walk through some Illinois politics and national politics, just for your education. If you're one of those people who cries themselves to sleep, worried that this country doesn't have a third-party alternative, we strongly urge you to hop on the internet and follow the twisty path of the Illinois Solidarity Party, which was briefly acquired by the New Alliance Party of New York and ran New Alliance Party founder Lenora Filani as the Solidarity Party presidential candidate in 1988 and 1992. Then, once you're done doing that homework, follow the career of Lenora Filani, who chose the Peace and Freedom Party activist Maria Elizabeth Munoz as her vice presidential running mate. Two years later, Filani became affiliated with the Patriot Party, which later competed for control of the Reform Party, which was founded by H. Ross Perot. Filani also started a group with the hilariously oxymoronic title, the Committee for a United Independent Party. Think about that for a minute. A United Independent Party. Filani was also active in both the International Workers' Party and the Independence Party of New York. Filani initially endorsed Reform Party candidate Pat Buchanan in the 2000 presidential election and served a short time as a co-chair of his campaign, Eventually, she dumped Buchanan 
and endorsed John Hagelin, who was the candidate of the Natural Law Party. So boys and girls, there are lots of third party alternatives out there. And there always have been. So if anyone tells you they don't have enough choices, there isn't enough on the menu, there's not enough uh, a specialization in the party structures to suit them, direct them in the general direction of the Illinois Solidarity Party. <laughs> Meanwhile, Harold Washington won in 1987 because his base loved him. Think about that, too. That's Obama 2012. Yep, it sure as hell is. Mm-hmm. Harold Washington held his coalition together and won over some diehard haters. And he did it by being himself. He was authentically a man of Chicago. He was a brawler. He wasn't afraid of a fight in a town that understood and respected that quality. He waded into political battles, savoring them. And when he spoke to the public, he spoke to them in their own language. So when he said... If this were a street brawl, I'd know what I would do. Everyone knew what he meant. Yeah, but absolutely. He, he, you know, he. <laughs> there were a lot of people who grew up in Chicago, learning how to box. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember going to a, a, a city council meeting, and Richie Daly. Um, I'm sorry, not a city council, a budget meeting, and he knew every field house and every parish, and knew all the boxing people, boxing fighting. Th- those were qualities that Chicagoans grew up respecting. So when Harold Washington talks about a brawl, it's like, you know, it's going to be a political brawl, but if it gets down to it, I will be there on the street with you. And he meant it. But the story of Harold Washington ended abruptly and tragically with his death in 1987, just months after he was reelected. And uh, it was a lifestyle death, I think you could say. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, he he ate too much. He he stayed out too late. He had a grueling campaign schedule. He did not take care of himself. And he had a massive heart attack at his desk. Um, but unsurprisingly, the first thing that people started thinking of, especially among his supporters, were who poisoned Harold? Who killed Harold? Mm. Because, you know, there is a long and very ugly history of political assassination. And especially against black men, especially against black leaders. And people had every right to wonder why this popular mayor who'd finally won a clear mandate with the city council that supported him managed to die just a few months into his new administration. And, and his legacy lives on. There's a community college named after him, a memorial park, an apartment complex, as well as Chicago's massively and nationally renowned Harold Washington library. What a terrific library. It's a great library. It's a wonderful resource. Yeah. And it's, it's right downtown, smack right downtown. But what he really did, what people remember him for, was how he literally fought City Hall. And one, he changed the culture of city government and the perception of Chicago around the world. Yeah, his his administration, just to be clear, we're not putting a halo on the man. His, his administration suffered the kind of scandal that a lot of mayors suffer and have always suffered and will always suffer. That They were usually bribery or self-dealing, but for the most part, he made good on his promise to open up city government to everyone. City services that once ignored minority neighborhoods were fairly distributed. And African-Americans and Latinos and women and gays found themselves opened with opportunities in his administration that simply did not exist before him. And today, for all of its problems, and it has a bunch of problems, the Chicago city government is incredibly diverse. And that's because Harold Washington kicked open that door. At his re-election party, when he told the crowd, quote, in the old days, when he told people in other countries that you were from Chicago, they would say, boom, boom, rat-a-tat-tat. Nowadays, they say, how's Harold? And you know what? He was right. He really did change global perception. Him and pretty much Michael Jordan changed the, the tone and temperament and face of Chicago around the world. Now, without Harold Washington, there may never have been a guy named Barack Obama. Barack Obama, who repeatedly cited Harold Washington as an inspiration for his own campaign. But this is where our story takes a turn, because while Barack Obama took inspiration from the example of Harold Washington and owed a huge cultural and political debt to Harold Washington and the remnants of his coalition, Obama didn't learn the most important political lesson that Harold Washington had to teach, that when your openly racist enemies come for you with a sword in each hand, telling you to your face that their entire goal is to destroy you, offering olive branches and turning the other cheek is not only doomed to fail, it will actively encourage them to come at you even harder. As Mike Royko explained, 
Washington had grown up during a time when lynchings were real and the town sheriff was part of the mob. He was a, quote, smart, witty, politically savvy old pro, unquote, who knew exactly who and what he was up against. You know, I love Barack Obama. I voted for him twice. As my IVI appeal button will reveal, I, I vetted him for Congress. I thought he was a smart and is a smart and brilliant man, but that is not how Obama was raised. That is not his experience at all. Uh, simply put, for all of his many virtues and skills, Obama was not and never will be a brawler. And this is where I get a little vain and quote myself from back in 2010. This is from a post entitled Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Left. Quote, quoting myself, for his entire adult life, Barack Obama has succeeded by offering himself as the perfect midpoint between others, as a mathematical function, not a leader, as an averaging equation, not a true believer. Since he showed up on the political radar, he has marketed himself relentlessly as half black and half white, half American urbanite and half world citizen, half wonk, half preacher, half Harvard yard and half back of the yards, half red and half blue. And this bone deep reflex plus his formidable intellect and ability to rise to the rhetorical occasion, would have prepared him perfectly for the presidency if this were 1960 and he were white. But it's not 1960, and he is not white, and he's not dealing with Harvard conservative pals or the Springfield Republican politicians. And being results agnostic, being a process guy, when the process is utterly broken, no longer works. Instead, the ideologically lockstep right led by Rupert Murdoch and the Koch brothers have found in Obama their perfect patsy, the Democrat who seems constitutionally incapable of counterpunching, who can only feel comfortable while suspended between two opposing positions and who will therefore find a compromise between opposites even when he has to invent wholly fictional opposing views to which he can cede half of the playing field. And that's the end of my part of my post from 2010. The legacy that Washington left behind and the lesson that too many Democrats and media persons have refused to heed is that the only way to deal with thugs and bigots is to verbally and politically punch them in the mouth every time they say something awful or untrue. To never sacrifice the core principles on which your coalition was built in order to try to appease your nakedly hateful, hostile opposition, and to never be afraid to call out your despicable opponents by name and by deed from the podium and in the press. You won't win every battle, but your people will know that you care enough about them to fight like hell on their behalf. And that is the true legacy of Mayor Harold Washington of Chicago. Don't forget... <laughs> Now, don't forget. Drift Glass, I, I put 30. We, ne we need 30 more Patreons. And Drift Glass edited that and said 3,000 more Patreons. Yeah, we're looking for about 3,000 more Patreons. <laughs> uh, no, we're looking for about 30 more uh, to make this podcast fly. So if you can afford to support us in that way, please do so at patreon.com forward slash pro left pod. And really, thank you sincerely for doing that. And we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. The Professional F Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions.